So today we're going to read chapter 30 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Monday, September 16th to Saturday, September 21st, 1776. The British Army paraded up Broadway the next day, cheered by loyalists all wearing a red ribbon or flower in their hats in support of the king. I did not see this, of course. I overheard the report that Madame gave the master as they ate supper that eve with their house guests, the two officers who had moved into the bedchambers on the top floor. The highest ranking men of the British Army had taken over the empty rebel mansions. Lower grade officers had moved in with loyalist families who had suitable furniture and staff, such as the Lockton's. Only we didn't have a staff. Becky had vanished, her rooms at the Oliver Street boarding house abandoned. I was the only servant in the house. It mattered not. My bones were hollow sticks, my brain pan empty. I cooked chicken and roasted potatoes and carrots. I left the chicken over the fire too long because Madame ordered the silver polished at the table linens ironed in honor of her guests. The bird was so dry and near splintered the tongues of the officers. Madame let loose on me in the kitchens after the gentleman had taken Master Lachlan to Ashley's tavern for a night of beer drinking and pipe smoking. It mattered not. When Madame finished scolding me, I set to my evening chores, cleaning out the ashes from the bedchamber fireplaces and carrying them outside, bringing in the firewood and laying the fires in case the night turned cold, turning down the beds, cleaning up from the supper and sweeping the floor. When I finally lay down to sleep, I set Ruth's doll beside my head. I had stopped kissing it good night. I did not say my prayers. My bones were hollow and my brain pan empty. Madame ran me like a donkey all the next day then demanded that I stay awake all night to make rolls for breakfast because the bakers in town were rebels and they had fled. I did as she ordered and ruined two perfectly fine batches of dough. I threw them down the privy and baked cornbread deep in the night for what was one thing my hands knew how to bake. The cornbread burned to charcoal when I fell asleep, head on the table. It mattered not. Three mornings after the invasion, a message was delivered to the master as I served coffee. I set the note on a small silver tray and I carried it into the drawing room. The officers were in the middle of excusing themselves from the table, buttoning up their coats and putting on their hats. And after the master said his good days to them, he opened the note. A social invitation, Madame asked, or business? Neither, Lockton said. It's a desperate plea. He handed the note across to his wife. Aunt Seymour is in need of Sal. All of her Dutch girls fled and she is without a servant. Madame snatched the paper from his hands. Well, surely she can do it herself. We have company. Why should we go without a servant? We have only had two men lodging here. Somehow Aunt has managed to take on a dozen Hessian brutes. She requires our assistance. Madame gave a little shudder. Hessians, the hired soldiers from Germany, had a fearsome reputation. She scrumpled up the paper. I will not perform housework like a common wench. Tell her to just hire someone. The times demand sacrifices, Anne, just for a week or so. Women will soon come to the city looking for work, and you and our aunt will be able to hire a full staff. Madame scowled into her cup. You favor her over me, Eliu. It seems unseemly. Lockton wiped his mouth with his serviette. The loan of the girl is the least we can owe her. I hope you regret your decision to send away the sister. Even small hands would have been helpful now. Madame bit back the hot words in her mouth, picked up the serviette, and, and cleaned her off her tin. You will clean the kitchen and prepare the dinner, girl, and then you will take yourself to the house of Lady Seymour and do what she requires of you. Lockton shook his head. No, Sal, you'll leave immediately. I took a clean apron and Ruth's doll with me to Lady Seymour's house, and in truth, I did not walk there quickly. In truth, I dawdled something fierce. Folks said the Hessian soldiers were fire-breathing monsters who walked across with swords drawn and blood on their chins. I figured that would just be about as bad as Madam. I was never near correct. They did not breathe fire, though they spat when they talked. Nor did they walk about waving their swords, though some had sported knives in their boots. None had blood on, on their chins, except when they ate rare cooked meat. I found it hard not to stare at the enormous mustachios that sprouted under their noses especially when the men combed and waxed them and twirled the ends. Their speech sounded like they were swallowing rocks, but Lady Seymour understood them. She learned the German from her husband, she said, the way she had learned the Dutch. They were all manners of secrets locked in that old skull. When I served them supper on my first night, a couple of them said, Danke, to me. Lady Seymour explained that Danke is German for thank you. She told me not to be afraid. 
that they were just soldiers from far away from home. A couple of them were fond of, their ca of her cat, she pointed out, and how could men who like cats be bad? She tolerated them fair enough, except for the muddy boots on the furniture, and when they spread their butter on, with their, on their bread with their thumbs, that made her gasp and go pink in the face. I practiced saying Danke when alone. The, word, the work at the Seymour house was every bit as tiring as it had been Madame's, more so because there were more mouths to feed and boots to clean and basins to fill and linens to wash and coats to beat of dust. But Lady Seymour made sure that I had a proper meal three times a day and she let me sleep in the tiny attic bedchamber on the bed where I laid after my first time in the stocks. It was hot up there, but there were no mice nor worms on the floor when it rained. The city swelled by the hour with loyalist refugees who wanted to live under the protection of British cannons. Some of the folk returning from exile were surprised to find strangers had taken up their houses and were sleeping in their beds and wearing the clothes they'd left behind. There were many fistfights, a great deal of name calling, and threats of duels. The British didn't mix with the arguments. They had, they had war on the brain, drilling their soldiers from sun up to sundown. At the middle Dutch church, they pulled out the pulpits, the pews, and the floorboards and let the horses of the light dragoons practice. Horses in a house of the Lord made some folks grumble, including Lady Seymour. Up to the tea water pump, I found only for unfamiliar faces, slaves who had freed themselves by joining the British. I cannot bring myself to speak to them. The old man we called grandfather had vanished. Maybe he had started his own revolution and led Curzon and the other slaves over to the River Jordan to freedom. A fanciful notion. Twas useless to ponder such things. Friday stretched long and longer because the Hessians had moved into five more of their countrymen. I heard Lady Seymour arguing with the fellow in charge, but he would not listen to her pleas. I spent the afternoon chopping a field's worth of cabbage while, while a half pig roasted in the pit dug by the men in the flower garden. The soldiers ate their supper and drank more beer than I thought a body could possibly hold. They lost a few manners they possessed and used the table linens for blowing their noses. It was a relief when they finally left for merrymaking elsewhere. I prepared a tray of supper and served it to Lady Seymour in her bedchamber, the one room where she could find peace. When my chores were done, I climbed to my attic room, kicked off my shoes, and laid down on the bed without even removing my skirt or bodice. Ruth's doll lay next to my head, her eyes staring up at the ceiling. I knew I ought to pray for Ruth, or Mama, or for anything. I, I ought to pray, but the words just would not come. I feared the spirit had left me, and I slept. When I woke, the city of New York was consumed with burning hellfire. Chapter 31 of Chains by Laurie House Anderson. Saturday, September 21st to Sunday, September 22nd, 1776. I awoke coughing so hard, I near brought up my supper. When I finally caught my breath, I smelled the smoke and saw the light. Bright as day, outside my window, I jumped from the bed and peered out. It was not morning, it was an inferno. Flames curled out of all the windows next door. The rooftop beyond that was a lake of fire. Every building in sight was burning. The air was filled with crackling and popping sounds, with shrieks and screams coming from the streets below. And a hot gust of wind blew the curtains back and sent the fire straight at me. Fiery shingles floated from the roof and caught at the branches of the trees outside my window, setting the bark ablaze. A burning leaf drifted to the sill. I quickly brushed it off, my hands quivering. Get out! Seized again by coughing, I fell to the ground where the smoke was not so heavy. I pulled my shoes towards me and I quickly buckled them on. And then I took a deep breath, rose to my feet, grabbed Ruth's doll off my bed and opened the door. The smoke filled the hall, curling down from the ceiling along the fingers with fire, of fingers of fire. Get out now! I clattered down the stairs, screaming, fire, fire! The door to Lady Seymour's bedchamber was just opening. As I went to pass by, she grabbed my arm. Quick, child, help me, she cried. Her chamber was even brighter than the attic, but the windows were closed and the smoke was thinner. She bent over an enormous trunk by the wall. It contains all my valuables. She pulled a handle. Please, Isabel. I reached for the handle and tugged. The trunk did not move. It's too heavy, man. Leave it. The roof is afire. No, wait. She flung open the top. The trunk was filled with a silver tea set, a small portrait of a yellow-haired man, something wrapped in a velvet cloth 
dusty sacks, small wooden boxes, and packets of letters tied with a ribbon. There was another crash outside and screams. I grabbed her, her arm. We're gonna die if we stay. She pulled out the letters and two small boxes and thrust them at me along with the portrait. Take these. I stuck the portrait and letters in my pocket and I balanced Ruth's doll on top of the boxes in my arms. The room was so hot I thought the corn husks might explode into flames. Lady Seymour grabbed two of the sacks, the coins within clinked together as she rose to her feet coughing. Hurry, she gasped. The smoke in the hall was thicker than it had been moments before. We felt our way, one step at a time, to the staircase. I went down first with the lady behind me, her frail hands on my shoulder. My eyes watered. My lungs felt like they were pulling in the flames. I thought for a moment we were trapped. The thick haze tricked my mind, and I knew that not if we would should proceed down or up. My eyes filled with the crackle of burning wood. Help me, Lady Seymour cried. Her hand vanished. Ma'am, ma'am. The smoke stopped up my throat. There was a thunderous crash overhead, a ceiling giving way, or a piece of the roof collapsing. The old woman had crumpled to the stairs. Is she dead? I put my hand on her chest, and her heartbeat was light and fast as wings birds, uh, birds' wings beating against a cage. I put my face close to hers, and I screamed, Get up! She moaned once and tried to move her hand. I pulled her arm. She moaned again, but I could not be gentle. I dropped the boxes and doll and draped her arm around me and half fell down the rest of the stairs. Once on the ground, I opened the front door and dragged the two of us out onto the street. The air was a swirl with flame, soot and burning shingles, each caught in a devilish whirlwind. The cries and screams of men and women mixed with the terror of the horses burning alive in the locked stables. Windows exploded, exploded beams crashed and trees split, their crowns ablaze like torches in the hand of a cruel giant. I felt the clothes on my back ready to ignite, the brand on my cheek scorched, as if the fire within me called to the fire in the air. Move or die, the whispered the flames. I dragged Lady Seymour north, then east away from the course of the wind, which blew like bellows and fanned the flames. British soldiers looted a burning house, running out with arms full of silver and forks and spoons sticking out of their pockets. A dog, a dog ran by howling, its tail on fire. We passed a family, all in their night clothes, throwing buckets of water against the wall of their house as the fire chewed through the wood. A group of men had harnessed themselves to a fire wagon that held a large tank of water, but one of the wheels broke and it proved too heavy to drag. One more block and we could go no farther. Lady Seymour and me collapsed into a heap on the edge of the graveyard. Time burned up while we lay there, caught in the sparks that flew overhead, swallowed by the noise of a city ablaze. When I finally came to my senses, I sat up, I coughed at length, and breathed in slow. It hurt, but it was not the death of me. Lady Seymour still lay beside me, shaking her head from side to side in the dirt and muttering, I bent my ear close to hear her. The bells. Where are the bells? She asked. Had the fire ruined her mind? Why was she worried about bells? You're safe, ma'am, I said, patting her hand. She frowned. Why don't the bells ring alarm? Her words were garbled, like she was talking underwater, but I finally understood. Every bell, every church steeple should have been ringing loud and fearsome, but they were all gone melted and reformed into cannons. I stood up over the rooftops. I could see men pouring water on the flattish roof of St. Paul's, the buckets handed to them from a long line of people that stretched to the backyard pump to the south. Trinity Church was not as lucky. Its tall steeple was a pyramid of fire, the flames licking the underside of the clouds that scuttled above. What shall we do, ma'am? I said. Her tears turned black as they rolled through the soot on her face. Her left arm lay limp, as if the cog within her had snapped. She didn't make a sound. It was up to me to make the decision. Come, I helped her. We need to make our way to safety. I stood to, to her left, draped the useless arm over my neck, and hold, held her body tight to mine. In that manner, step by slow step, we staggered on. We passed countless people standing in the streets like statues, their toes bare on their stones. Night clothes blowing in the unnatural breeze, mouths agape. 
Carts rolled by carrying half-naked people, bleeding and dazed. A collection of charred bodies had been stacked in a corner not fully covered by a blanket. A child's boot and stocking lay in the gutter next to an overturned rain barrel. Step by slow step, we made our way to Wall Street, then down to 7th House on the left. She was near insensible by the time we reached. In truth, I pinched her as hard as I could. It roused her some. She lifted her working leg. Thus, we mounted the steps of the locked-in house and entered the front door. That's the end. Chapter 32 from Chains by Lori House Anderson. Sunday, September 22nd to Thursday, September 26th, 1776. Near 500 homes were destroyed that night, plus shops, churches, and stables. Thousands of people were homeless without even a change of underclothes or clean stockings. Many did not eat meat for weeks on account of the death smell that poisoned the air. The job of finding bodies was so gruesome, it had caused grown men to scream out loud. Folks said the fire started in Low Groggery near the White Hall Slip. From there, it burned uptown, pushed by strong wind, devouring Bridge Street, Dock, Stone, Marketfield, and Beaver. Then it ran up both sides of Broadway. Almost every building from Broadway to the edge of the North River was in ruins, all the way up to the open field below King's College. They called it the Burned Out District. God's judgment over the British, whispered the Patriots. Rebel sabotage, said the Loyalists. Most figured the Americans wanted New York burned to the ground to leave the British without shelter. While the fire still raged, groups of soldiers searched for arsonists. One man was found with rosin and brimstone chipped slivers of wood in his pocket, and he was tossed into the burning cobbler shop. Another was quickly executed with a bayonet through the chest. Half a dozen men were hung while the fire still raged, one from the sign of a post in a tavern. Another was hung from his heels and had had his throat slashed. The day after the fire, they captured a school teacher named Nathan Hale, up island near the Dove Tavern. He admitted that he was a spy, but he did not set the fire. There was no trial, nor proof of his guilt. They just put a rope around his neck, and they hung him high. Folks talked about the pretty speech he gave before they kicked the, school, the stool away from his feet. He said he was sorry that he had only died once for his country. The lobster backs laughed at that. I coughed up mouthfuls of soot for days. My eyes felt crusted with embers. No matter how much I rubbed them or rinsed them with clean water, they remained swollen, red, and hard to see out of. I was lucky, though. I wasn't killed or burned. I had not even twisted an ankle running, running from the flames. All I lost in the confusion was Ruth Stahl. All I lost was everything. My bees swarmed back into my, bread pan, ba my brain pan. They hummed so loud I need not ponder on the baby doll. The burned over district looked like the inside of me. It was hard to tell where one stopped and the other started. I feared my wits had been melted by the flames, twisted and charred. Dr. Daston gave, came to examine Lady Seymour. The left side of her body had gone to sleep and would not wake. The doctor said it was apoplexy, brought on by the fire. He bled her twice and prescribed mer meridant drops to cleanse her blood. Master Lockton insisted his aunt should recover in the bedchamber he shared with his wife. Madam was not pleased with this arrangement, but she said nothing for a change. She visited the ruins of the Seymour house daily, waiting for them to cool enough so that she could poke through the ash with a hoe in search of coin or melted silver. Lady Seymour called me to her bedside when she regained her senses. She tried to thank me, but the affliction pulled at her mouth and it made it hard for her to figure her words. I gave her the portrait of the yellow-haired man and the letters that I stuffed in my pocket as we fled. She studied them close, close with her good eye, and then she sobbed and both her eyes overran with tears. Madame bade me to leave the room. By the third day after the fire, the locked-in house was packed tighter than a barrel of salt cod and it smelled even worse. We had been invaded again. Many of the rebel houses that were occupied by British army had burned to the ground, and now soldiers found themselves as homeless as regular folk. So their commanders, they ordered anyone with an undamaged home to share it with their men. We wound up with 11 fellows from Kent sleeping three to a bedchamber and using the second floor drawing room as their common area for dining and conversating. The master and madam moved their bedchamber to the downstairs front parlor and gave the library over to Colonel Hawkins, a high-ranking officer whose favor Lockton sought. 
The cellar was turned into barracks for five soldiers who had their wives with them. This was the Lord's blessing on me because the women were used for cooking and cleaning of the men's regiment. The new boss lady in the kitchen was named Sarah, a black-haired gal with a baby on her belly. She was not a friendly sort of girl, with sort of them they were, but she did not call me names nor seem inclined to hand out beatings. I did really miss Becky, Becky Berry more than I thought possible. It was odd sleeping in the cellar with strangers. They sure did snore. The women ha were as bad as the men. Their bodies gave off noxious odors too. Gases as strong that made my eyes water. The night of the first frost, I woke up to a soldier pulling off my blanket. I laid in the dark, fists clenched and teeth sh sharp, thinking he meant to do me harm. He did not. He just was cold and he needed another layer of cloth. Next morning, Sarah agreed I could move my pallet up to the kitchen hearth. It was lonely sleeping without the foot, the fool doll. Chapter 33 from Chains by Lori Helse Anderson. Friday, September 27th to Saturday, November 16th, 1776. The autumn passed in a dodd weary haze for me, with much work and little time to ponder or breathe. Everything was cloaked in gray, oyster gray, charcoal gray, pewter gray, mole gray, storm gray, and ash. Scraps of ash floated through the air for weeks and found their way into everything from the butter to the tea. The rains turned the ash to mud. Frost painted the ground to the color of a gravestone. Ashes trapped in ice. I, fla I flaked ashy too. Mama used to rub the salve of bear fat and mint on us. Winter approached on our skin would not dry and crack. Was Ruth's skin dry? Did anyone notice? Ashes drifted into the hollow places in my bones and slitted my brain pan. I had the fanciful notion that perhaps we had died in the fire and they were all lost souls, forbidden to enter heaven. When I had low thoughts like that, Curzon's voice would call from my memory and tell me to join him, become a rebel. I told that voice to hush. With the ash so thick inside and out, I had few thoughts to spare for that fool. I figured he was dug in the troops of Fort Washington, which seemed like a good place. What with the strong walls and the cannons protecting it, folks said the British couldn't attack the fort until spring. The men drilled and patrolled, and Sarah and the other soldier wives spent most of their days down at the campground doing the chores for the regiment, washing clothes in a big iron pot, cooking whatever they could find to roast or stew. They did some tidying at the locked-in house and kept the officers fed too. The dirtiest jobs fell to me, water hauling, wood chopping, and chamber pot emptying. On top of that, Colonel Hawkins claimed me for his errand girl, sending me out with messages for his captain, or that sergeant, or a search, or snuff, or hair powder, or almonds. He was terribly fond of almonds. By the time the apples were harvested, hundreds of ships crammed with expensive British goods crowded the docks. The price of food doubled and doubled again. This did not affect the Locktons, nor the rich loyalist refugees who streamed into the city toting bags of gold. We took delivery of enough potatoes to fill the bin in the cellar and had no trouble buying meat. But regular folks burn, burnt out of their homes and penniless, loyalist refugees on the run from the rebels, they were forced to shelter in Canvas Town, the new name for the burned over district. They used tent canvases to make huts against the standing chimneys and half-crumbled brick walls. They ate beans and rice when they were lucky and begged on the streets when they were not. One day I noticed that the plants grown from mama's seeds had been killed by the frost, the stalks dead on the ground with shivered paper leaves, a lump of mud stuck in my throat. I had forgotten to care for them. I collected the few seeds left from the flower heads and wrapped them in a, strap a scrap of cloth that lay loose under the board in the pantry where I had hidden my sliver of lead from the king's statue. As the weather turned colder, Lady Seymour's mind cleared and her body strengthened. She could walk with help and move the crippled arm, but her mouth still dragged at the corner and her speech was hard to follow. Madame was not entirely pleased whether her husband's aunt was mending. I heard her grumble to Lockton that the old birdie will never die just in spite of us. A month or so after the fire, I was setting down a clean pitcher of water in Lady Seymour's bedchamber whilst Madame read the newspaper aloud to her. I thought the lady was dozing, but her eyes snapped open when Madame described how British soldiers had looted the city hall library. They stole books, ruined paintings, and broke scientific equipment stored there by the professors of the King College. 
Lady Seymour made Madame repeat the entire story and then demanded pen and ink and paper, fighting her way out of the blankets with her good arm. Once dressed warmly and settled at the writing table, she composed a strongly worded letter about the library destruction to General Howe, supreme commander of the royal forces, and called for a glass of brandy and a bowl of soup. After that, it fell to me to walk with Lady Seymour along Wall Street on days when the sun was strong. She hired three seamstresses to sew her new wardrobe and included a heavy skirt and thick woolen cloak for me in the order. I protested that I couldn't pay for the clothes, but Lady Seymour simply pointed to the portrait of the yellow-haired man, her husband, on the mantel and his letters stacked next to it. We will not discuss payment again, she said slowly. Thank you, ma'am, I said. After the pigs had been slaughtered and fresh pork was for sale in the market, another wave of British officers moved in and set up their camp beds in the second floor drawing room. The long dining table was covered end to end with maps. The men would stand over them, chins in their hand, trying to figure out how to finish off the rebels. They were now scheming to finish the war in time for New Year's. Battles and skirmishes were fought on the north part of the New York Island, though the city was safe. Whilst they plotted Washington's downfall, I dozed in a chair in the hallway in case they needed victuals or bottles of port. Sleep was a rare precious thing to me in those days. The next day, I was yawning hard as I trudged up to the tea water pump. The November wind carried the promise of snow, and I was glad for the new cloak that Lady Seymour had given me. Soon I would need rags to wrap around my hands. My muddled head did not register the great hullabaloo at first, but my, my ears awoke. Folks were shouting and hurrying towards the Greenwich Road where it dumped onto the commons. I was not sure what the race was for, but I lifted my skirts and I joined along with it. They got him! They got him all! cheered a red-faced man, throwing both arms in the air. By the time I made it to the commons, I had to fight my way to the front of the cheering mob. The end of the Greenwich Road was lined with British soldiers, relaxed and laughing at their prisoners, captured American soldiers walked three to a row between their enemies through the doors of the Bridewell prison. Was there a battle? I asked as the serving girl next to me. Up the fort, she answered. Them Hessians kills lots. Blood was running like water, they say. They fired them cannons from the ship. They blew arms and legs everywhere. Heads, too. I nodded, unable to think of what I should say. A chant started in the crowd and singing, I did not join in, nor did I throw clods of mud as many did, including the bloodthirsty girl next to me. The rebels kept coming in, row after filthy row, most with their heads down, some limping with a crutch or an arm in a sling. Their uniforms were torn and tattered, and a few walked barefoot over the icy cobblestones, flinching when it hit square with mud or rock. They carried neither flag nor weapons. Their breath billowed like they were hard-ridden horses. It hung around their heads like smoke. He was towards the end of the line with the other enlisted slaves, his head bent forward, his face invisible. A bloody bandage was tied above his right knee and it looked painful to step with his right foot. The only way I knew him was that hat. Never brown, nearer brown than red now, with a rip through the brim and the ring around his ear. The guards shoved the last of the prisoners, including the boy with the red-brown hat, through the doors of the prison and closed them with a loud metal clang. Chapter 34, by, from Chains, by Lori House Anderson. Sunday, November 17th to Sunday, November 24th, 1776. I had no time to ponder Curzon's fate. Madame commanded that a supper be thrown to celebrate the capture of Fort Washington, complete with turtle soup. The house fair exploded with dust and activity. The junior officers cleared out their cots, clothing and maps from the second floor drawing room so we could scrub and polish it from ceiling to floor. The kitchen hearth was crowded with irons heating to press the tablecloths and serviettes. Madame hired the cook from the city tavern to prepare the meal. Folks said he, was, he had a way with turtles. She, she then chose the prettiest of the soldier wives to wait the tables. The ugly ones and Sarah with her big belly were to stay in the kitchen to, sorry, in the kitchen to assist the cook and wash up. My job was to ferry the food up the stairs and the dirty crockery down. The food began arriving long before sunup, packed into the crates and hauled by sleepy-eyed boys. Three turtles, each the size of a footstool, came in a wooden pen. The sound of their flippers scratching made Sarah yelp in fright. Two of the turtles kept their heads tight against their shells. 
The third stretched out his neck and watched the commotion with the wet, solemn eyes. While we scurried to finish the house and the cook butchered the turtles and plucked the pheasants, the hairdresser arrived to tend to Madame. He spent hours applying pomatum wax, patting the lengths of brick-colored hair to fashion a high roll on Madame's head. The hair swept off her brow and soared into the air like a wave curling before a ship's prow. I thought that the wave might crumble, but Madame didn't ask my opinion. She wanted a pot of hot chocolate made with two handfuls of sugar, which is kind of a shocking amount. Sarah and the cook were exchanging heated words in the kitchen. Empty turtle shells stood drying in the corner, and the cook's assistant stirred the thick pot of bubbling over the fire. I grabbed the chocolate pot and I left, not wanting to see what became of the poor creature's heads. As I served the hot chocolate and tidied the chamber, Madame rubbed her face with Venetian bloom water beauty wash to remove the wrinkles. After that came a layer of Malino Italian's paste to make her skin white as bleached linen. It made her resemble a corpse. And then the final triumph. She used a tiny brush to paint a thin line of blue above each eye. Madame opened an envelope and shook out two gray strips of moose fur, a uh, sorry, of mouse fur, <laughs> her, each cut into an arc. Leaning towards the mirror, she glued the mouse fur onto her one eyebrow, making them bushy and thick as the fashion required. Hmm. In truth, she looked like a woman's she looked like a woman with two lumps of mouse fur stuck on her face. A delicate bell sounded overhead and Lady Seymour summoning help. The guests will be arriving soon, Madame said, admiring her reflection. And Seymour wishes to be seated in advance of them. You may assist her. After I helped the lady limp from her chamber to her place near the end of the long table, I placed a foot warmer filled with hot coals under her chair and spread a woolen blanket over her lap. She thanked me kindly and looked about. When I was young, we, like, we dined like this every night, she said with a sigh. I could scarce credit it. The table was covered by the finest linen tablecloths I'd ever seen. Each place had china plates, crystal glasses, and ivory handled knives and forks. Candles were positioned every three hands. Uh, salt cellars, each with a tiny spoon, and pepper mills were set in easy arms reach of each place. Smaller tables and sideboards were positioned at the edge of the room to hold trays and dishes. One table was covered with wine bottles. Candlelight reflected back and again on the polished mirrors that hung from the walls. I caught a glimpse in the hearth mirror of a girl with a mark on her cheek that trumpeted her shame. I quickly turned my eyes away. There was a heavy knock at the door. It begins, Lady Seymour said. Go below, child. I set the tray loaded with the turtle soup bowls on the table by the door. Three more trays needed to be brought up to the stairs, but I allowed myself a quick peek at the company before I fetched them. The table was crowded with officers wearing splendid uniforms and perfectly powdered wings, wigs, along with several of Master Lockton's business companions. Lockton wore a cardinal red satin waistcoat, black satin coat and breeches, and shoes with silver buckles. The new clothes could not hide the fact that the master was grinding himself down with work. Long hours serving the British commandment had melted off the fat from his second and third chins and created a heavy black circles under his eyes. But his bags of gold, of gold grew fatter, and that was what he cared for most. Madame reigned over her end of the table with the occasional flutter of her fan, and the wave of a hair above her brow threatened to crash at any moment. Lady Seymour, on the other, only other woman present, looked like an elegant spider wrapped in a black lace shawl. Her eyes were lively in the candlelight, and her cheeks had color for the first time in weeks. The officer next to her was the size and shape of Edward, the shaggy bull who lived down the road from us in Rhode Island. The man did not have a ring in his nose, but he laughed with an impatient, snorting sound. I hurried up and down the stairs with the remaining trays of soup, then the roasted tongue and mushrooms. The serving girl cut the meat on Lady Seymour's plate before setting it down so that the weakness of her arm would not hinder her. The young soldier who was appointed wine steward danced around the backs of the guests, keeping their glasses full. The conversating flowed as fast as the wine. The talking of Fort Washington, news from London, plans for a fox hunt, and in this last, an officer joked that the next fox would be a tall sort from Virginia, by the name of George Washington. That caused a hearty laughter all around the glasses were raised. A serving girl hissed at me to go back to the kitchen. When I entered the room a half hour later, my arms shook under the weight of the tray. The cook had prepared enough to feed a battalion. 
Pheasant stuffed with figs, stewed oysters, potted larks, green cooked with greens, cooked with bacon, pickled watermelon rind, and buttered parsnips. The pheasant smelled good, and I hoped that some might find its way into the scrap bucket. By the time I had lugged the dessert tray, rice pudding, lemon biscuits, two creamed pear tarts, and an ice cake, the fire was blazing and the room was much warmer. And the two of the officers had loosened their, la their, la their lace neckcloths. The heat had softened the glue of Madame's left eye mousy eyebrow and it had begun to free itself from her face, but she didn't notice this. The serving girls and the wine steward watched the progress of the eyebrow and fought to keep smiles from their faces. The voices of the men were loud and booming as if the wine they drank affected their hearing. I handed a plate of tarts to one of the serving women who carried it to the table and set it in front of Colonel Hawkins. So, how many rebel prisoners did your men bag, Colonel? said Master Lockton. I passed another dish of tarts. Near 3,000 of the devils, we wish we could have shot them all. My hands shook as I reached for the third. Why so, Lockton said. We have no place to put them. The Colonel pushed the tart to the side and reached to the bowl of shelled almonds in the middle of the table. He tossed a few in his mouth and crunched loudly. I thought you were using Bridewell. That should provide ample space, said Lockton. The colonel snorted and shook his head. The prison is so stuffed, the walls are ready to burst. We've had to pack them into sugar houses and confiscated churches too. He reached for more nuts. It's a right nuisance. Never thought we'd have so many. I'd say so many pr prisoners are a badge of honor for your men and the king, Lockton said. The colonel raised an eyebrow. We don't need a badge of honor. We need a decent plague to take them off our hands. The men at the table chuckled. The expense of feeding them is gonna be staggering. The rebels planted the seeds of war, let them enjoy their harvest. Lockton ate a forkful of tart, forced the local patriots to feed them. I say shoot them, growled the man who looked like Edward the Bull. Of course, then we'd have to dispose of the bodies. That's messy work, you know. Waste of ammunition, said the colonel, and some members of parliament would fuss like wet hens. No, I predict a cold winter will dispatch them with the natural ways. Lady Seymour spoke up. What if the rebels decide that turnabout is fair play? We need to care for them so they do not harm our British captives. With all due respect, ma'am, the man said with a smile, the rebels would first have to capture a prisoner. Given their blunders, it's really unlikely prospect. Lady Seymour nodded gravely. But what if the prisoners they took after their victory at Breed's Hill? The table fell still at that. Talk of what happened at Breed's Hill in Boston was as rude as stating that Madame's false eyebrow was about to fall off. The Lady Seymour was the wealthy, elderly widow of a British lord, incapable of social error. So all pretended that she hadn't said a word. Several men cleared their throats and reached for their wine. Madame lifted her goblet. I'm told there are plans to reopen the John Street Theater. This heralds a return to civilization and order. Her eyebrows flopped into the rice pudding. The man seemed to the right of her, coughed loudly into his napkin. The wine steward's face turned the color of a plum, and a serving girl bit down on her lip to prevent laughter. Madame avoided looking at her pudding. Hmm. A toast, she said, with a serving wobbling wine. A toast to civilization, Lockton added. I've heard plans for a cricket club, too. As the men roared in approval, I carried the tray loaded with the dirty supper dishes down the stairs. On my return trip upstairs, I carried two pots of coffee. My trips up and down the stairs continued until my knees threatened to fold up and quit, bringing dishes down, carrying more delicacies and hot drinks, down, up, down, up, a hundred miles of stairs that night. As the candles guttered out and were replaced with new ones, Madame and Lady Seymour returned to their bedchambers and Lockton's business companions left to, pay bill to play billiards at the King's Head Tavern. The officers requested more coffee, lit their pipes, and unrolled their maps across the tablecloths stained now with splashes of turtle soup, butter, wine, and candle wax. The serving girls moved down to the kitchen where the kettles of water were put on a boil for the washing of the dishes. The cook was long departed and Sarah dozed on a kitchen chair, her swollen feet propped up on a pillow. I picked up the enormous bowl of table scraps and headed out the back door. Miss Mary Finch always mixed table scraps with muck and spread the smelly mess on her garden come spring, but the Lockton's weren't much for growing things and not when the markets were so close at hand. Scraps here, they were just dumped down the privy. I closed the door behind me and stopped. The cold air took my breath away. The sky was a black curtain, the stars, ice chips whittled by an old knife. I wrapped the shawl tighter across my shoulders and I pulled it high to protect my neck. 
and through the kitchen window I could see the two of the women squabbling about who was going to wash and who was going to dry. The second floor windows glowed with candlelight, shadowed by the shapes of the officers circling the maps. I shuddered and my teeth banged together. Water would turn solid tonight. It was a bad night to be without a blanket. Would they truly allow prisoners to freeze to death? The soldier wise stopped arguing and the men lit fresh candles. The stars wheeled above me inside, deep inside, and something turned. I couldn't name it or recognize its form. I drew in a cold breath and blew it skyward. The air came out of me in the shape of a cloud and it drifted above the rooftop and dissolved into the stars. Were they gonna let him starve? The stars said not a word. The back door banged until I jumped. Don't tarry, said Sarah. You need to dry the last of them glasses before you go to sleep. Yes, ma'am, as soon as I finish this. I quickly carried the scrap bowl out into the yard, walking past the privy all the way back to the stables wall where straggly holly bush grew. I glanced quick at the house to make sure no one was watching. I pulled aside the br prickly branches on the bush and I set the bowl down within it. I covered the bowl with my apron. And on my way back to the house, I loaded my arms with firewood. I doubted they'd notice that I left the bowl outside, not with me bringing in wood. I took another deep breath of the frozen air before I opened the door and confused that I should be awake after such a long day. I frowned as my thoughts tumbled and multiplied. I'd been invaded. A dim plan had hatched itself in my brain pan without my consent, but I didn't much like it. And that was the end. Chapter 35 from Chains by Laurie House Anderson, Monday, December 2nd, 1776. I had to wait three days to sneak up to the prison. My chance came when Madame received an invitation from a friend who had moved into an abandoned rebel house in Greenwich Village, north of the city line. Madame smiled in triumph as she read the note and then told me to clean her best shoes. And after the midday meal, the soldier wives helped Lady Seymour and Madame into the carriage. I brought out foot warmers filled with hot coals and heavy blankets to lay over the women for the air was crackling and cold. The driver snapped the whip above the heads of the horses and the carriage rolled away. The soldier wives waited until it was out of sight, then dashed off to visit their own friends. When they were gone, the house stood empty for the first time in months. I lined my shoes and cap with newspaper and kept to keep out the wind and I emptied the leftovers hiding under the holly bush into a bucket that I covered with an old rag. I stood across the street from Bridewell Prison and I pondered hard. Don't do this. Don't do this. All around the common folks went on about their business, soldiers rubbing the cold out of their fingers, women wrapped in long cloaks and, cloaks and thick shawls. They walked over to the ground where the gallows had been built last summer, where they hung the traitor hickey. Back in August, the Patriots had torn it down to use for wood for the barricades. The British had built their own hangman's platform at the opposite end of the commons. It could kill three people at a time. The ashes in my soul stirred. Don't do this. Men stood at the windows of the prison, calling out to those who passed by. Few folks looked in their direction, pretending that the noise came from the throats of the crows circling overhead. Go back, tis not your affair. The whisper in my brain pan grew louder as I crossed the street. Madam's gonna beat you bloody. He's not your concern. It's not your place. Go back, go back before it's too late. The crows cawed and wheeled and beat their shiny black wings against the wind-whipped clouds. They saw everything. I stopped in front of the iron-studded oak door and I frowned. He freed me from the stalks. He's my friend. He's my only friend. With that, the ashes settled and shushed. My arm lifted light as a feather and pounded the door knocker. A giant guard opened up. What do you want? He growled. He looked like he was fashioned by setting boulders atop boulders. His hands were like iron mallets and his face rough carved out of granite. He was a mountain clothed in a lobster back uniform. No, no, nothing but a do-gooder, he grunted when I explained my mission. He lifted the corner of the rag that covered my bucket and sniffed. Hmm, got anything tasty in there? Scraps, sir. Mistress normally feeds them to the pigs, but eh, she's a good soul. She told me to bring them for the prisoners. I lied. He grunted, peered at the bucket, and poked through with a finger. Mmm, rice pudding? Yes, sir. The guard crossed the room, took a bowl from the shelf, and used a spoon to dig the rice pudding from the bucket. And you're kin to this boy you're seeking? Yes, sir, my older brother, sir, I lied. Always was a stubborn cuss, made Mama cry herself to sleep at night. Why ain't your mother here then? She's dead, sir. Mm, that much was true. 
The guard was more interested in the rice pudding than my patchwork story. He shoveled several spoonfuls in his mouth and chewed while he was looking me over. Come on then, I'll give you a little time. The sound of his key turning in the lock brought back my time at the city hall dungeons with the mad woman and the rats. Despite the cold, a trickle of sweat inched down my backbone. We walked down the hall lined with four doors on each side at the end, a staircase. He stopped at the last door on the, lock, on the end and unlocked it. There you go, he said. The cell was a little bit bigger than the one I had con confined in. It was filled with men and boys milling around like nervous cattle herded into a goat pen. There was no fire burning, nay, not even a hearth where they could burn it. A short man dressed in black peered out the cell's one window, stuck in the middle of the outside wall. The man's collar was flipped up to protect his neck, his hat was pulled down, and his hands were stuck in his armpits for warmth. The window had a bar across it, but no glass. It was an empty hole open to the rain, wind, and snow. All turned to stare as we entered. Girl, come see your brother, guard said. Excuse me, sir, I said as he sta I started to close the door. Uh, what about my bucket? Mm, needs a little bit further inspection. No one said anything nor moved until the guard finished reloading, relocking the door and his footsteps echoed down the hall. You'll be wanting him from in the corner, said the short man at the window. Show her. A few of the prisoners stepped aside so I could see a bundle of rags on the floor. Curzon was lying on the stones with no blanket covering him, no pallet under him, not even straw. His leg was wrapped with a bloody bandage. His lips were dry and cracked. He clutched his hat in one hand. I crouched next to him, unsure what to do. The soldiers around us grew tired of staring and returned to their low conversating. I leaned close to the figure to see if he was breathing. And finally, I put my lips to his ear. Are you dead? I whispered. He answered without moving. No country, are you? I, I near jumped out of my skin. Curzon! His eyes opened slow, bloodshot and bleary. Can you sit up? I asked. I suppose so. I held him, I helped pull him upright and he winced and leaned against the wall, shaking with chills. Here, I untied my heavy cloak and I laid it over him. He protested, you don't have to. Hush, did you get shot? He pulled the cloak under his chin and shivered again. In the leg, my luck held though. The bullet went right through fair clean, it didn't break the bone. He stopped as a man nearly broke into a fit of coughing. I sat next to him. Was it awful? I asked. He closed his eyes and he shook his head. You don't want to know. Yes, I do. When the Redcoats invaded, he started, we raced up the island to the fort and figured we'd hold there for months, then drive them from the city come spring when our forces would be stronger. Ha! spat the man closest to us. He rolled over to face the wall. Did you shoot a gun? I asked. Ah, um, we'll say just dug ditches and carried rocks. The soldiers, they worked alongside us and they drilled to get ready. When the battle finally started, the men fired their guns so fast the barrels grew hot. The cannon's smoke was thick as fog, and I saw the most horrid sights. Country, it wasn't fit for any person's eyes. He swallowed hard. I wound up next to a militia boy from Connecticut, and he just learned to shave, and he was poor hand at it. He had razor cuts all over his chin. He said he was worried his pa was going to be mad at him on account that he didn't make it home for the apple harvest season like he'd promised. He fell silent for a moment and then continued. So this boy, he had two muskets, one of his own and the other one from a fellow who died on Long Island. And when the Hessians came at us, the boy would shoot one gun and I would reload the other. And we continued this, loading and shooting and loading and shooting half the day. The British moved their small cannons up the hill and took aim and I loaded and he shot. And as I handed him the gun, a cannonball ripped his head right off his body. We sat there without a word. The ashes within me swirled and filled my throat again. Around us, men muttered low and coughed. Curzon let his tears run. And after that, I just shot the guns for myself. I took the bullet in my leg and they just kept firing. An hour or so later, Colonel Maga surrendered the fort. We laid down our weapons and walked out. The British called for our officers to walk forward and we feared they would be shot. Were they? I asked. Not hardly, he said, to off said a little straighter. Officers get special treatment on account of their considered gentlemen. They have parole to walk around the city. They live in boarding houses and they eat regular food. The man who faced the wall muttered a string of curses that echoed against the stone. He said every kind of bad word imaginable about officers, gentlemen of the war, the British, the Congress, and then he cursed himself for leaving his wife and farm in Maryland. Curzon's tears dried, leaving a trail of salt down his cheeks. You should go home now. But before I could ask a hundred questions, the key turned in the lock and the guard appeared. He stuck out the bucket. Inspection complete, he said, wiping a smear of butter off the side of his face. 
I stood, walked to the door, and looked into my bucket. Half of the food was gone. I s May I stay a little longer, I asked. Sing out when you need me, the guard said with an unsettling wink. And as soon as the door was relocked, a man with powder burns on his face snatched the bucket from my hands. I'll take that, he snarled. I held tight to the bucket and shouted, get back. The man grabbed my arm, his fingers like claws, like a panther. Enough, shouted a powerful voice. The cell fell silent as a tomb. The short man dressed in black limped over to us, his post by the window. Release that bucket, Private Dibding, he ordered. The thief did not did as he was asked, but crossed his arms over his chest and stood his ground. She brought food for the black boy, Sergeant, he complained. Tain't right for the slave to eat and then we starve. The tiny sergeant stood motionless, somewhere water dripping. No one here's gonna starve as long as I have a breath, he turned to me. Excuse the poor manners, miss. We've not eaten in three days. Hungry men, they're sometimes rude. I understand, I said. Would you be willing to share what you've brought, he asked. We would be most grateful. The sergeant looked in the eye. He wasn't much taller than me. Well, that's enough. There's enough here to feed everyone. There's not enough here to feed everyone, sorry. I know that, miss, but we're all equally hungry. Ah, don't fuss, country. We fought together, we eat together, said Curzon. Outside, a heavy cart rolled down Broadway and the driver calling to his horses. There was an argument from the cell on the other side of the wall and a thump from one above. I handed the bucket to Curzon. The, masti the nasty man dug his claws into my shoulder. The sergeant goes first. I waited for him to release me, fighting the urge to bite his wrist down to the bone. And once I let go, I gave the bucket to the sergeant. He looked inside and pulled out a piece of pie crust the length of my finger. He handed the bucket to Curzon, who, remo who removed a long parsnip peel. The bucket made its way around the room at a snail's pace. Each man studied the contents and chose a small portion of discarded potato or bread or grizzle. And when it was returned to me, I was confuddled. Um, there's still food in here, I said. They're fine men. Each took his portion without stealing from the next. Mind if we send it around again? No, sir. As the bucket went down the line again, the sergeant motioned for me to stand to him close to the wall. I uh, wonder if I might ask you a favor. What kind of favor, I asked. We need to pass messages to our captain and he'll be able to get word out to the city and some of the other women folk who bring food to the prison are helping in this manner. I can't spy for you. No, 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 not spy, just a message carrier. You come by here, I drop a word or two in your ear, you pass it along. It'll put me in danger. It's a way for you to continue our fight for freedom. The bucket was moving more quickly the second time around. I cannot, sir. I was not fool enough to let the Patriots hurt me again. They, the key sounded in the lock and the bucket returned to my hands, wiped empty this time. The guard entered and Curzon struggled to his feet and handed me my cloak. Here, no, no, I said, you keep it. As soon as I fall asleep, it would be borrowed, little sister. Bring it next time you come. I wrapped the warm cloth or cloak around my shoulder and was struck with a sudden notion. I pulled the newspaper out from my cap and I quickly removed the pages lining my shoe. Can you use these? Hurry up, said the guard. Curzon smiled. Just what I need for a bed. Go home now. I nodded grateful to be leaving and a heavy with guilt. You'll be here when I return? I don't plan on leaving anytime soon, he said. <laughs>